If you would please find your seats, we'll begin the service in five minutes.
Please find your seats. We are grateful to everyone for coming this morning to share your love and our collective sorrow at the loss of our beloved rabbi and teacher. Before we begin the service, if you'll do us the courtesy of taking out your cell phone and being sure that it's turned to silent so it doesn't disturb the service. We offer our thanks this morning, together with our prayers of condolence to the Showweiss family, to Malka, Lisa, Seth, and Ethan, their spouses, their children. We thank you for the opportunity to share these moments with you, and to share our grief with you. In respect to the family, we have taken special steps this week to allow the family their own time to grieve and mourn for their father and their grandfather. To that end, when this service is complete, the burial service will be private, open to family and their special invited guests. The entire community is invited back here to Valley Beth Shalom at 6 p.m. this evening, where the family will be present to greet visitors and tonight, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night this week, each evening, the family will be here at 6. We will pray the Mariv prayers at 7 and share the recitation of Kaddish with the family. As well, we have asked rabbis and teachers and leaders from the community to join us each night and to teach us and reflect upon Rabbi Showweiss's life and legacy. Their names are listed in the program in front of you. And we're grateful to those rabbis and teachers. I'd like to offer a very special word of thank you to Nancy Sherkon and the leaders of Valley Beth Shalom for their graciousness and all their help in setting these services up, to Bart Pacino, the executive director, to Rick and all of the directors and employees of NASDAQ and Orion for making these services safe, comfortable, and possible. The staff of Valley Beth Shalom for all of their efforts. Rabbi Showweiss made every person he met feel important. 
And certainly every person who walked into the synagogue was welcomed as a guest and a friend. And so it is our privilege to welcome all of you. A very special welcome to our colleagues, the rabbis, teachers and leaders of the Jewish community, and the leaders of so many faith communities who share the rabbi's legacy. We take a moment to offer a special recognition and welcome to Mr. Jay Sanderson, President of the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles, to Council General David Siegel, Council General of the State of Israel here in the Western United States, to Rabbi Steve Wernick, Executive Director of United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism, and to my teacher, Professor Elliot Dorf of the American Jewish University. To all of you, and to all of you who have come, to all the community leaders, to all of the activists, to all of the students of Torah, to all of the friends, thank you for coming to share these precious moments with us. We begin the service with the recitation of the 23rd Psalm. Adonai Roi Lo Exar Bino Teshe Arbitsini Alle mei menuchut, alle mei menuchut, in alle nabshi shove, shove. Yam cheni hemagen leitzedek. Yam cheni hemagen leitzedek. Leman shemu. Gam ki elech begay etzal emavet lo hirara ki atahi madi shiftecha o mishan techa Hey, my dear, my Dishanta Vashem and Roshi Kosi Revaya Achtov Achesed Yerdefo The shaft the wait on my lay
great rabbi raises great students. We call forward now Rabbi Joshua Hoffman, Rabbi Stuart Vogel, and Rabbi Ronald Schulman. So much of my life I live for others. So much of my life I rival to excel others and seek to become like others. It is a vain ambition. The words of Rebbe Mendel of Kutsk address my search. If I am I, because I am I, and you are you, because you are you, then I am I, and you are you. But if I am I, because you are you, and you are you, because I am I, then I am not I, and you are not you. Everything in the world, Rebbe Mendel said, can be imitated except truth. For truth that is imitated is no longer truth. Whom dare I imitate, and what self-deception would I perpetuate? God does not create clones. God does not create redundantly. There are no spiritually identical twins in the world. It is a precious and difficult wisdom to come to recognize that I am unique and that even my stumblings are unique. To preserve the singularity of my being is to overcome a lifetime of imitation. At the end of my life, God will ask, not why was I like another, but why I was not myself. This Rabbi Shulais wrote in selections, when I rise and when I lie down, and we learn of his truth, that he was incomparable. To imitate Rabbi Schulweis is to walk around with an encyclopedia and to articulate words that are buried deep into the tomes of that encyclopedia and expect you to understand what he means. When I first met Rabbi Schulweis, I admit I was a bit nervous. And so when I extended my hand to express the typical gesture of pleased to meet you, I said, pleased to read you. <laughs> In our last conversation, our last conversation was for a book that I had ordered for him, a commentary on Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes, one in which he had already written selections. And I would have liked to have had that conversation with him. How would he have thought differently about that elusive book of the Bible? I've had the honor and privilege of serving as a rabbi in this community to stand with families in their time of loss. Rabbi Schulweis used to walk around with this book, and whenever he pulled out this book, which is a collection of his poetry, we were certain that expressions which were penned onto the page were reflections of his heart, his consideration, his love, for the other in his midst. And I heard him read this at funerals for those whom he especially loved. And I share them with you. 
consolation. I would comfort you, dear friend, wipe away your tears, turn your sorrow into joy. I would console you with words of ancient wisdom of the need for acceptance of the inevitable, the inexorable course of life. I would speak to you of the immortality of influence, the afterlife of memory, the echo of goodness in the cavern of our lives. Yet the sages caution not in haste to console the bereaved not too soon to begin the healing. I would raise the heavy weight from your heart, wave a wand to transform your grief, but the heart has its own wisdom, sees its own time, and will not be rushed. Now is the time for silence, the dumb silence that awaits the coming of a new mood and a brighter spirit with you, my friend. I will be silent. Tomorrow we will speak. Yi zichro baruch. Malka, I'm here uh, in part as an officer of the International Rabbinical Assembly to, um, to express condolences on behalf of our executive director of uh, Rabbi Julie Schoenfeld, our president, Bill Gershon. 1,700 members of an organization he was a member of for his rabbinic life. We are all saddened by his loss. Well, he was affiliated with the Rabbinical Assembly, I imagine that every denomination will want to claim him. That's his wisdom. That was his gift to us all. But more significantly, I'm here because I spent five wonderful years with Rabbi Shulais. As his second rabbi. I said second rabbi because he never called any of us assistant or associate because he said you weren't ordained that way. And why should people look at you? as anything less. Most of you know his uh, contributions, his great contributions to this community, to the world at large, and you may, you may judge him as a great man because of the foundations that he created, because of the impact he's had in the Jewish world, the Jewish thought. But I want to share with you a little bit about how truly great this man was. I want to share with you a little bit about the man behind the title. Namely, what was the great Oz like behind the curtain? When I was interviewing at Valley Beth Shalom, 1987, remember I was up with the interviewing committee up in his office in the couches that faced each other there, and the small group was there, and the phone rang on, the, uh, on his desk. We were talking, and he went up and picked it up and paused for a moment. And then I heard him say, hi, Cookie. when I first learned of his nickname from Malka and the true love affair that they had. And he took that phone and he was talking to Malka and the committee, this distinguished group of people turned and looked at him and started going, shh. I said, they're shushing the great Oz? <laughs> How do you do that to the Rabbi Shulweis? Hey, this is a myth, a legend. I was intimidated to barely talk to him and and then, when they took the phone off the desk, he sat behind it on the floor and in a hushed voice continued his discussion with Malka. On that day, I learned about rabbinic humility. And I learned as a rabbi that family comes first. And when your wife calls, you take that call no matter what. <laughs> I remember the t-shirt, and some of you remember this one time a congregant gave him that said on it in big letters, as long as you remember that I'm God, we'll get along just fine. 
What was even better was that he actually wore it. <laughs> Another occasion when, I was, uh, when he was approaching sabbatical for two years, we were interviewing some of the rabbis. And I can still remember in Weiner Chapel, a group of interviewing, and one of the rabbis were talking. And, and this particular rabbi said, you know, I'm, I'm so unimpressed by rabbis who have to use big words to impress others. Everybody else who's just sitting there trying not to look at Rabbi Shoais. <laughs> and then he looked at me when nobody was. He gave me that little mischievous smile. Rabbi Shoais, on those occasions and many others, taught me never to take myself too seriously. There are many times he would come into my office and he'd have ideas, programs, thoughts, things that he was working on. He would just sit in front of my desk and start talking. And then I'd have these moments where I thought, oh my God, the Rabbi Harold Schoys is in my office. He's talking to me, little picture Stuart Vogel, and he's expounding on these great ideas. Well, one, uh, one Monday morning, I walked into his office. First thing to check on him, he was just getting off the phone. Hangs up, he looks at me, he goes, that was a rabbi from back east who was asking me some questions about something I spoke about on Shabbat morning. Remember, this is long before internet, where information you get out immediately, right? This is about 25 years ago. And he looked up at me, he said, how does he know what I spoke about? And I looked at him, I said, Harold, you are the rabbi Harold Schulweiss. <laughs> and he looked at me, and it didn't register. See, he never knew that he was the Rabbi Harold Schulweiss. I learned, I learned so much from him. When I left Valley Beth Shalom in 1993, I was um, saddened to leave this remarkable community and still so many friendships and relationships. And I was concerned about who would follow me. Would they have the same love, and respect, and admiration that I had for him? And then Rabbi Ed Feinstein came along. Malka, you were, a, you were his cookie. His children were his pride and joy. His grandchildren, I remember this, brought renewal to his life, a freshness, a new perspective of life. But Ed, I want to acknowledge you for the way in which you cared for looked after our friend and mentor. You always demonstrated respect and dignity that he deserved. And you made sure that he could fill his calling as a rabbi for as long as he wanted. And all of us are so grateful to you. My final recollection deals with 25 years ago. Rabbi Schweiss and Malk invited us to their house for dinner. And as we drove up, Rodi and I, to their house, uh, I said to Rodi, I said, now remember, um, you can call him Harold. He's fine. He has no pretenses about that. Now, remember, Rabbi Shoish is the one who officiated her bat mitzvah, uh, Rodi, up on this bima, uh, probably. Um, so we went into the house. It was a lovely dinner, Malka, you prepared. And um, two hours later, sometime three hours later, Rodi and I walk out to the car and... Uh, and I said, so? What happened? Like, no Harold. And she looked at me and she said, I was just about to call him Harold. And then he spoke. <laughs> and it was the voice of God. And how can I call God by his first name? Ironically, and much the negation of his predicate theology, for most of us, the voice of God was the voice of Harold Schulweis. It will be the voice pushing us to struggle with God, our obligations to humanity. For me, it's the voice of humility and modesty. It's the voice calling me to find the best in others, to always challenge the status quo. I'll miss that voice. I'll always hear it resonating in my heart, in my soul, in my mind, to be a better person, to make the world a better place. Zecher Tzadik Livracha, his righteous memory.
will always be a blessing. I am a rabbi because Harold Schulweis was my rabbi. His passion inspired me. His compassion touched me. His fierce intellect taught me to take Judaism seriously, to see our tradition as an ethical voice of conscience and conscientiousness. Rabbi Schulweis taught me to interpret with intelligence and to create with meaning, always using the vocabulary of Jewish tradition and the memory of Jewish experience. I heard in his uniquely resonant voice wisdom for life and purpose for living. The power of his oratory was in the truths of which he spoke and the issues about which he thought out loud. Rabbi Schulweis reveled in ideas, Jewish ideas, all ideas, his ideas. Therefore, so did I. Rabbi Schulweis believed in the potentiality of his words. Elegant and precise, his words elevated us. Often complex and uncommon, his words raised us to a higher place of understanding, took us to a deeper place of insight, and moved us toward a better vision of ourselves, our people, and our society. As he often told me, Rabbi Schulweis was a ventriloquist in the pulpit, guiding us to make the beliefs and concepts he presented our own, enabling us to create the Jewish communities he imagined. I was 14 years old when I first met Rabbi Harold Schulweis. It is a surreal moment to stand on this bima and to stand here with my colleagues and friends in the community where I grew up and to remember him. I first met him at that age of 14 in the weeks just before he began his tenure here at Valley Beth Shalom. When I was USY president, he challenged me and my teen peers to dream bigger dreams. He danced with us out on the parking lots at rallies on behalf of Soviet Jewry. He encouraged us to dance horrors and bring our energy to the synagogue on Friday nights. And when I was a college junior, he invited me to travel from Boston and meet him in Philadelphia at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, where he was to deliver their commencement address. After the speech and the ceremony, we were escorted to Rabbi Mordechai M. Kaplan's private library, where he proudly showed me original notes and manuscripts from his teacher. As I thanked him for the tour and all of the introductions, he smiled, he put his arm around me, and he warmly whispered, you're welcome. Now if you decide to go to rabbinical school, you won't go here. <laughs> right, Elliot? You'll go to the University of Judaism in the Jewish Theological Seminary, which I did, and where he and so many others nurtured the formation of my rabbinic worldview. Installing me as a congregational rabbi, he told my new synagogue community that the bond between rabbi and congregants must be built as this one was built, on mutual trust, honesty, and genuine love. Through the years, he offered counsel and asked probing questions. He invited me into his trust. Together, we marked the milestones of life and career. Not Adam without Eve, not Abraham without Sarah, not Ron without Robin. He said at the end of our wedding ceremony on June 22nd, 1980, which was also his and Malka's 33rd wedding anniversary not Harold without Malka either. 
When we reached the point in our relationship that he told me to call him Harold, I said, thank you, Rabbi Schulweis. <laughs> Through most of my adult life, he was much more a part of my life than I was of his. Still, for 45 years, I have been blessed to carry his voice, his words, his Torah, his advice, his caring, and his example with me. I am a rabbi because Harold Schulweis was my rabbi. May all of our personal stories become a sacred part of Harold Schulweis's enduring legacy, comforting you who are his loving family and sustaining for all of us his memory. There are so many friends, colleagues, teachers across the country who sent us words to share, among them some who were the closest to the rabbi. And we're going to ask Rabbi Noah Farkas to share some of those words with us. And before he does, we'd like to ask a dear old friend, Robert Flug, who is Baltfilla at Temple Beth Am, to share with us, please, the recitation, the singing of the 121st Psalm. It is an honor to stand before you, to stand with dear friends, wonderful colleagues, wonderful teachers, to pay homage to a wonderful man, and to offer words of comfort to a wonderful family. From the valley of our deep shared sorrow, we lift our eyes to the high places. We cry out, from where will our help come? Our help comes from Adonai, maker of the heavens, maker of the earth. Psalm 121, a song of ascent. Please join me if you can. <clears throat> At the end of every chapter of Talmud, 
At the end of every Masechet, there is a sentence. It begins with the words, Hadran Alecha. Hadran Alecha is an ancient form of Hebrew that says, we will return to you. It is meant to say that at the end of a section of learning, when we think the very last seed of wisdom has been collected and the harvest has been brought in, we make a promise and a vow. We make a promise to return to these fields to sow again, to learn again, and to find new seeds of wisdom to collect again. At the end of every chapter we learn, at the end of every word of Talmud, at the final period, we say these words, Hadran Alecha. This comes from a very ancient chain of tradition. Many of the rabbis in this room, including myself, have learned from Rabbi Schulweis, who learned from Rabbi Kaplan and Rabbi Heschel, who learned from their teachers, who learned from their teachers. The chain is unbroken, even though a giant has been felled today. I remember my interview story on those couches here at Valley Beth Shalom. I was very nervous. I had met many of the professionals in the congregation, many of its lay leaders, and then Rabbi Feinstein brought me in and sat me down on that couch and said, Rabbi Scholz would like to talk to you for a few minutes. Close the door. And I'm staring at Rabbi Schulweis, and I look over his shoulder, and on his desk is a very small placard in the Hebrew word that says, chashov, which means think. And over the next hour, rather than talking about what it means to be a rabbi or what it means to work here in the valley or at Los Angeles, he asks me about my master's thesis in Jewish philosophy at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And we talk about Weber and Kedushin and Kaplan, a number of other philosophers. And by the end of the conversation, I realized he hadn't asked me a single question about what it means to be a rabbi and whether I would be a good fit here. What was perhaps one of the most meaningful moments of the beginning of my time here in the community is when Rabbi Feinstein came in, we stood up, we said hello, and Rabbi Shulwe says, I approve. I didn't realize I was actually in that moment then being, you know, he was interviewing me on that level. You see, Rabbi Schulweis was, was an intellectual giant, and I've been asked today to share a few words from his colleagues. In the Torah, we know that there is a Torah Shabichtav and a Torah Shabaal Peh, a written word and a spoken word. And we know that while he will no longer write any more sermons or any more articles, or that he'll never start a new initiative with us. And while his chapter is coming to an end, his Talmidim and his students and his Talmidei Talmidim, his students of his students continue his work. And while the Torah Shebichtav comes to an end, the Torah Sheba Al Peh is just beginning. And so these remarks come from his colleagues as his Torah begins to live on beyond himself. From Yitz Greenberg, he says, we always knew that we were in the presence of greatness. The quality combined with his warm charisma and brilliant, always substantive teaching is what attracted people in such large numbers to come to him. We knew that he was one of the great public intellectuals of Jewry of the past half century a peerless synagogue and organizational builder and the humanitarian who embraced all of humanity. Still, as I have reflected on his life, since con comfort, uh, confronting the bitter, inevitable fact of his death, I have come to see a level of depth to his contribution. Harold was a prophet. By this I mean he saw ahead of his time and his generation and prescribed what the Jewish people needed to do in the moment of transformation. This was a crossroads where much could be gained or all could be lost, and Harold showed us the way to go. With his deep inside, he saw that Jewry, indeed all human beings, were entering a moment of unprecedented freedom and choice. 
It was the opening of a society and culture, the unparalleled communication and media, so that for the first time in history, every lifestyle and religion was exposed to every other. Life, faith, behavior became a matter of choice. He recognized this, that it was a gain for human dignity and that it coincided with an increased divine hiddenness and presence in the secular. It followed that the impact of religion became a matter of performance of tikkun olam and not just ritual excellence. Harold grasped that the key to all this was tzelem elokim, that every human being was in the image of God. He believed that to know the other person or religion or lifestyle was to develop a respect and love and feeling of responsibility for them. He knew that Judaism and Jewish identity would be freely chosen and the only only because of its highest possibilities. His Judaism led him to embrace and be concerned for all of humanity, including those who saved Jews during the Shoah and those who continue to suffer under the impression of genocide in Africa. And so, Harold, even though you have filled their life with loving kindness, righteousness, and blessings and peace, we all say goodbye with love. Go with our blessing and peace, and we shall not forget. And from Rabbi David Ellenson, I know that so many of you here today will speak and think lovingly and fully about Moreno Vorabeno Harold Schulweis. He was touched and transformed our lives in so many ways. And I would thank my colleague and friend Rabbi Feinstein for inviting me to add my voice to those others who pay tribute to Harold. I do not even pretend to know how to express my gratitude and respect, indeed my love, for Harold Schulweis. When I first moved to Los Angeles in 1979, he invited me to lunch, and soon thereafter, he asked me to teach an adult education class at Valley Beth Shalom. Later, I was honored to serve with him and Rabbi Feinstein on high holidays, and a remarkable and nurturing relationship was developed and maintained for the next 35 years. Rabbi Shulweis was for me, as for many of you, my yoetz, my counselor. In 2001, when I was pondering whether to leave my academic post at HUC and seek the presidency of Hebrew Union College, it was Rabbi Schulweis I knew I had to approach, for I struggled with this decision. I knew that I had to consult a person whom I respected and trusted before making my decision, so Rabbi Schulweis was that person. Like so many of you in this congregation who have faced critical moments in your own lives, I called Rabbi Schulweis and I came here to VBS to seek his advice. Rabbi Schulweis took me out for lunch and we talked and discussed what this position would mean for me my family, and the Jewish people. In the very end of our conversation, he told me that he thought it was imperative that I apply for this position. He told me that I will be able to do a certain amount of good in the world for the Jewish people that would exceed anything I might be able to do, no matter how important, as a professor. That discussion was a turning point in my decision to make application for the position I had held for more than a dozen years. If Harold Schulweis, who taught all of us over and over again how to make the words of Torah and the teachings of our Masoret, our tradition, real and present in the world. If Harold Schulweis, who asked all of us over and over again how our community would treat the weak and the downtrodden. If Harold Schulweis, who bore his monumental learning with such grace and humility, and who inspired us on every occasion with his intellect, his goodness, and his heart, told me that I needed to occupy the position of the president of Hebrew Union College for the good of the Jewish people, how could I not do so? Whatever positive contributions I made during the time I served in that post, I owe in no small measure to Harold. I, like so many of you, admired him in his humanity and his Yiddish neshama, his goodness, and righteousness beyond measure. All of us know that Harold Schulweis was swifter than an eagle and stronger than a lion in his life. He was a prince in Israel, and we will not see his like again anytime soon. Tzadikim b'metatam chayim hem, the righteous even in death live on in their words and deeds. Finally, from Rabbi Harold Kushner. Harold Schulweis was always my role model in what a rabbi could aspire to be and do, even as I realized I could never match his energy, his boundless compassion, and his ability to see challenges 
where the rest of us only saw problems. He never let me forget whom we as individuals and as a Jewish community were obliged to care about. And he taught me that I needed to do for them. I am proud to think of him as my mentor, my inspiration, and my friend. May his memory, like his entire life, abide with us as a blessing. Finally, I'd like to add that I've been asked to teach a little bit in his name a very brief section of the, of the Talmud that we know so well speaks about who he was. Amar Rabbi Chama bar Rabbi Chanina, my dichti vacharei Adonai lehechem telechu. Rabbi Chama, in the name of Rabbi Chanina, asked, It's written, after God's ways you shall pursue. How is it possible to follow God's ways? Rather, it's not God's ways that you follow, it's God's attributes that you follow. Saying, just as God clothes the naked, you too shall clothe the naked. And just as God gives food and shelter to the poor, you too shall give food and shelter to the poor. And just as God visits the sick, you shall visit the sick. And what Rabbi really wanted to convey in these words to us is that it's not that we follow God's midot, God's attributes that make these things such divine actions. It's that the goodness in each one of these actions is what makes them divine. Because at every moment, at every interaction that we have, with every person that we meet, nothing less than divinity itself is at stake. Because as Rabbi Schulweis teaches, each one of us is a divine wager in the world. That goodness and consciousness can overcome avarice and greed. The love we have for each other and outstrip our own personal ambitions. Which means that the goodness that we find is truly divine in each one of us. The Gemara concludes, HaKodesh Baruch Hu Nichem Avelim Af Ata Nichem Avelim HaKodesh Baruch Hu Kaver Metim. Avata Kavor Metim. Just as God gives comfort to those who mourn, we too give comfort to those who mourn. And just as God accompanies the soul to its final resting place, we too accompany Rabbi's soul to its final resting place. Hadran Alecha, Rebbeinu from Moreno. We will return to you, our dear Rabbi, <clears throat> while your written word is complete, your Torah Shebichtav has been completed. Our master and our teacher, your Torah, is not. We will return to you and to your teachings to sow the fields again and to reap the bountiful harvest. Adonai chafetz the man sikto yagdil Torah v'yadir. We rise together now. I ask you to please open your booklets as we say the rabbi's Kaddish, a custom for completing a, completing a section of learning. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabbah. Me'aman divra chirote ve'amich malchute V'chayechon v'yom me'echon v'chayechon v'yit Yisrael Ba'agala o'bizman kari v'yimru amen Yehesh me'rava me'varach le'olam o'me'am V'yit barach v'yishtabach v'yit pa'ar v'yitramam V'yit hadar v'yit tale v'yit talal sh'me d'kudsham v'yichu Leila minko birchata vishirata, tush bechata venechamata, dam iran viyama viyimru. Al Yisrael veal rabbanan veal tamidehu. 
Mihokol Tami De Tami Deho. We all call Maanda Skimba Raita Diva Atra Hadin the Diva Hola Tarviatar. Yehe the Hon the Hon Shlama Rabba Hina Vahista Varachamin. Vahain Arehin Mizona Vilicha. Who for Kanamin Kadam Abohon Dibishmaya Vimru. Yehe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya. Vahain Tovim Malenu Vahoy Yisrael Vimru. Amen. Shalom bim Ramah, Uya says Shalom, Alenu vea ko Yisrael bim You may be seated. Rabbi Shulweis believed that the arts belonged as part of the synagogue, that they were sacred. And so he nurtured and uplifted wonderful composer Ami Aloni as the musical director of the synagogue. And then upon Ami's passing, two wonderful gifted musicians, Dr. Noreen Green and Mr. Chris Harden, who are here this morning to share the music that Rabbi Showweis loved so much, sung by the Valley Beth Shalom Choir. like to ask some of those who were the very closest to the rabbi to share their reminiscences and their words of tribute, beginning with his beloved cousin, Mr. Harvey Schulweis. I realize I'm the first person speaking this morning who has never called Rabbi Schulweis, Rabbi Schulweis. <laughs> um, how do you find the words to talk about someone who always knew the right words? As the most electrifying and dynamic speaker, delivering a sermon from this pulpit, or writing with insight and wisdom about some of the most complex issues facing Judaism, or speaking to us about the most important issues in our personal lives, or leading his family and guests at a Seder, or just sharing a meal across a dinner table. He impacted all of us in ways that will be remembered for the rest of our lives. My wife, Barbara, has often said that when Harold spoke, he was looking into your soul 
and you felt there was no one else in the room but he and you. Harold and I were first cousins, two boys from the Bronx. Our fathers, neither one of which were big fans of synagogue life, to be honest about it, they were brothers. Harold was 14 years older than I, and even though we were technically of the same generation, that is not how our relationship evolved. My father died when I was 22, and my mother when I was 24. Harold and Malka became parental figures in my life, mentors, counselors, inspirations that unquestionably molded me into who I am in so many ways. As a husband to his, his beloved Ima, or Cookie, father to Seth, Alisa, and Eitan, grandfather to 11, 11 adoring and adored grandchildren, rabbi to a very special congregation, and friend to so many. He evoked a feeling for which there may not be an adequate word, a combination of love, respect, admiration, and yes, awe that did not apply to very many others. His love for Malka, his children and grandchildren held no bounds. His devotion to this synagogue, its congregants and leadership was similarly without limits. His breadth of knowledge and depth of wisdom, vision, courage, and leadership changed the lives of all who came in contact with him. His seminal and groundbreaking ideas and progressive activism shaped ritual practice, changed attitudes towards so many challenges facing the world. His mission was to help us understand our relationship to our faith, to each other, to God, and to tikkun olam, repairing the world. He saw so clearly the imperfections that so many considered someone else's problem and went about to address matters of hunger, genocide, faith, and the recognition of goodness where it was deserved but not present. One could not help but being inspired by his brilliance, compassion for humanity, humility, and often humor, which was, by the way, not lost on the producers of The Simpsons. <laughs> he touched and changed for the better countless lives in his tireless, lifetime efforts to heal our broken world. He led this synagogue and created organizations to actualize his passions for change. I want to say a few words about just one of these organizations, the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous. More than 40 years ago, growing out of a conversation that Harold had with a congregant whose life had been saved through the actions of a Christian during the Shoah, Harold decided that there needed to be a uniquely Jewish response to the heroism of those non-Jews who performed these extraordinary acts. Since that time, because of Harold's unique vision, the JFR has provided financial support for thousands of aged and needy rescuers and has distributed over $35 million in fulfillment of his wisdom and mission. The JFR has also created a unique platform for educators to teach the story of the Holocaust while integrating the role of the rescuers. Harold asked me to chair this organization more than 25 years ago, and I have ded my, dedicated myself ever since to ensure that Harold's vision was fulfilled. As you all know, the JFR was not the only organization to which he gave birth. Jewish World Watch, an extraordinary response to genocide in Rwanda, the Havara movement, Mazon, were just some of the other products of his fertile mind. This brings me to another thought. <clears throat> there were so many... so many facets of my life, my relationship to my family, the workplace, my involvement in philanthropy, 
all of which were in large measure guided by what I felt would be what Harold wanted me to be and what would have brought him joy and pride. The relationship that Malk and Harold enjoyed through their 64 years of marriage was a model that I tried to emulate throughout my own life. I am sure there are so many of us here today that could say the same thing. We are who we are for many complex reasons, but in large part, it is because Harold was, in one way or another, a guiding factor in shaping us. Harold was a giant who did so much for the Jewish people and for all humanity. I loved him deeply. <clears throat> in the hole in my heart and in the hearts of all of us today, we'll be somewhat filled with many extraordinary memories of our relationship with him. As Harold wrote, when the dying is over, another memory takes over. Not obituary remembrances, not the memory that records indiscriminately, but memory that sifts through the ashes of the past to retrieve isolated moments. Memory is an act of resurrection that raises up from oblivion forgotten moments. I will miss him dearly, but will be comforted by the memories of time spent with him throughout my life. Mrs. Janice Kaminer Resnick, President and Leader of the Jewish World Watch, dear friend of the rabbi. Mourning by Harold Schulweis. Mourn me not with tears, ashes, or sackcloth, nor dwell in darkness, sadness, or remorse. Remember that I love you and wish for you a life of song. My immortality, if there be such for me, is not in tears, blame, or self-recrimination, but in the joy you give to others, in raising the fallen and loosening the fetters of the bound, in your loyalty to God's special children, the widow, the orphan, the poor, the stranger in your gates, the weak, I take pride. The fringes of the talit placed on my body are torn, for the dead cannot praise you, O Lord. The dead have no mitzvot, but your talit is whole and you are alive, and alive you are called to mitzvot. You can choose, you can act, you can transform the world. My immortality is bound up with God's eternity, with God's justice, truth, and righteousness and that eternity is strengthened by your loyalty and your love. Honor me with laughter and with goodness. With these, the better part of me lives on beyond the grave. Over the last many decades, and particularly the last 10 years, I have had the privilege of spending a considerable amount of time with Rabbi Schulweis. It has undoubtedly changed the course of my life. Like everyone in this room, I always loved, admired, and appreciated Rabbi Schulweis. His intellect, his oratory, his bold conscience and prophetic way of insisting that we dig deeper in our own souls and consciences, that we stop the argument about whether God exists and start finding the godliness and goodliness in ourselves and those with whom we share our homes, our communities, and our planet. There were always so many reasons to admire him. You know how it is. Sometimes you admire someone from afar, and when you get more familiar, what you see is less admirable. Quite the opposite happens with Rabbi Schulweis. The closer we got, the more I admired him. Rabbi Schulweis was not just our rabbi and teacher, and not just a social philosopher, an idea generator. 
and he was not just a man who called on our community to start an organization to fight genocide. For Jewish World Watch, he was so much more. He has been an active leader in realizing the organization's vision day in and day out for the past decade. He attended every monthly board meeting until very recently when he became too weak to do so. For years, he traveled all over Southern California with me, speaking to groups of all sizes, ages, and faiths. His humility was so evident in all of this community work. Several years ago, we took a long drive to address what was supposed to be a sizable audience. When we arrived, the crowd was embarrassingly small, and I was horrified. Rabbi Scholweis, however, did not skip a beat. He was fully engaged with the audience and was so uplifted on our drive home, never giving a second thought to the disappointing showing. He especially enjoyed our outings to meet with JWW's partners in other faith communities. He loved speaking with the priests and headmasters and students in Catholic and Christian schools. He forged our relationship with the Armenian community, making sure that JWW would become the first Jewish organization to support the long overdue legislation, which sadly still has not been enacted, to recognize the Armenian genocide. He marched with us in front of the Chinese embassy to protest the government's horrific human rights violations. And a few years ago, he was ready to go to Washington, D.C. to be arrested with George Clooney as a means of drawing attention to the genocide in Darfur. We had to stop him from that one as we knew it would not be good for his health. <laughs> in the ultimate display of support and commitment at one of our rallies, he actually put on a JWW t-shirt so he'd be a visible member of our contingent. Of course, he wore that over his shirt and tie. <laughs> over the past decade, I saw Rabbi Shulweis's characteristic humility, warmth, and charm fully evident in his one-on-one -on -one meetings with so many young teens who sought to interview him. He treated each of these sit-downs with the same seriousness and respect he would give to a Los Angeles Times reporter. During our board meetings, if someone forgot a name or the disposition of a certain debate from a prior discussion, he was right there, following every word, filling in the blanks that no one else in the room remembered, even in recent months when his health proved challenging and his energy was down. Right to the end, he would still, whenever possible, attend our meetings. When he couldn't make it, he always wanted a summary the next day, what was discussed, what was decided, who was there. and. We had a familiar ritual with each trip to Africa. He insisted on seeing us before we departed. He wanted to know our full itinerary and be reassured that we would be safe, and he would bless us. He'd read every one of our blogs when we were gone, following every aspect of the trip. When we returned, he'd want a full debrief. How were our projects progressing? Who did we meet? He'd want stories about the people we encountered, the individuals, the children, the new connections. That is what mattered most to him. He hung on to every word, at times saddened by the reality of the situation, and at times beaming with pride about our successes. It seemed that through his desire for details and stories, he was able to vicariously experience these difficult journeys. My immortality, if there be such for me, is not in tears, blame, or self-recrimination, but in the joy you give to others in raising the fallen, and loosening the fetters of the bound. Of all the visits and conversations I have had with Rabbi Schulweis, it is our very last conversation less than two weeks ago that was perhaps the most profound. It will stay with me forever. Already in quite a weakened state, Rabbi Schulweis was notably agitated about the events that led to the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and the chokehold that killed Eric Garner in New York. He said that these police practices are intolerable and racially biased. He asked why he was not hearing a louder voice of protest from the American Jewish community. Rabbi Shulweis was a man who simply could not tolerate injustice. Even as his heart was fading, even as he knew his end was near, he would not give up his pursuit of and for justice. And his expectation of us was clear as well, to continue that sacred work. The fringes of the talit placed on my body are torn, for the dead cannot praise you, O Lord. The dead have no mitzvot, but your talit is whole, and you are alive, and alive you are called to mitzvot, 
You can choose, you can act, you can transform the world. A while later that afternoon, Stan Zicklin, Malka, Rabbi, and I were visiting, and Rabbi Schulweis posed a question. He said, how do you know if you have lived a good life, a worthwhile life? After 40 years of being his student, I did a very Schulweisian thing. I turned it back on him. <laughs> I asked him, how would you evaluate whether you've lived a good life? Without hesitation, he said, a rabbi who has brought people together, people who are divergent in their views and practices, people who ordinarily would not have connected, people who were estranged or even simply irrelevant to one another, I would say that such a rabbi has lived a good life. What a remarkable moment to experience. A man near death evaluating the essence of his life's purpose as a rabbi. About 10 months ago, when Rabbi Shoais was ill, almost every board member of Jewish World Watch sent me notes to deliver to him. I want to share with you the words of one such board member, words which demonstrate so beautifully that Rabbi Shoais accomplished his dream. Dear Rabbi Shoais, I don't think that I have ever told you what you and JWW have meant in my life. By allowing me to be part of your extraordinary vision, you have altered my view not only of the world, but of my place in it. By starting this organization, you have challenged me and many others to leave our comfort zones and recognize that we can, in fact, do something in a place that seems so far away and remote. I see the world and our interconnectivity differently because of you. But most of all, I have been so touched by your inclusiveness. I love that JWW embraces anyone who needs us and that while steeped in Jewish tradition, we welcome and embrace all faiths. It is a powerful message that the world so desperately needs. Diana. Yes, Rabbi Shoais was an intellectual giant, a profound philosopher, an eloquent and prolific writer, an original thinker, and a masterful speaker. Those attributes made Rabbi Shoais a great rabbi. But he was so much more than just a great rabbi. He was also one of the greatest human beings that many of us will ever know. And that was the quality that made him so magnetic. At this year's walk to end genocide, it took a very long time to bring Rabbi and Malkit in a golf court from the parking lot at Pan Pacific down to the area of the walk. People of all ages thronged around the golf cart waiting, wanting to stop him for a photo. Hundreds of people from young kids to elected officials to religious leaders were taking selfies with Rabbi Showwise and posting them on their Facebook pages. In an area full of superficial fame, Rabbi Showwise provides a true model of celebrity. Indeed, not only in Los Angeles, but across the United States and far beyond, Rabbi Showweis is a superhero of a movement, a movement started in the last decade of his life. How remarkable. Between the ages of 80 and 90, when most people would be slowing down or stopping altogether, Rabbi Showweis conceived of and helped to grow a new global human rights organization. And he found room in his heart to make a whole new group of friends friends whose lives became intertwined with his. Listen to these words from one of our JWW board members. Dear Rabbi Schulweis, thank you. Thank you for standing up. Thank you for speaking on behalf of those who cannot speak, for being a witness, for calling on others to do so, when your eyes and arms could reach only so far. Thank you for opening your mouth and for opening my eyes. Thank you for helping teach me to recognize a different facet of myself than I knew before, for teaching me to better understand how much one person can do, and in reaching that realization, understanding that capacity can also mean responsibility. Thank you for having such a strong gravitational force and for allowing me to be pulled into your orbit. Please know that if it is you now having difficulty speaking, there is a chorus of voices here ready, willing, and able to continue to sing your songs and continue to speak for those on behalf of whom you have been speaking. Peter. On one of our trips to Congo, a group of survivors asked us to pray with them for their safety, and then asked us why we came to Congo. I told them about how Rabbi Shulweis for 50 years had asked, where were the people of conscience when our six million were murdered? I told them about Rabbi Shulweis's sense of despair at the end of the Rwandan genocide, when he knew that one million people had been murdered in 100 days, and about the shame he felt for not having mobilized and spoken out. 
I told them about the vow Rabbi Shulweis made that he would never again be silent in the face of genocide and how that led him to propose Jewish World Watch when the tragedy emerging in Darfur became clear to the world. And then I told them that in our synagogue, we also pray like they do, but that Rabbi Shulweis has taught us to pray not only with our hearts and our lips, but also with our feet. One of the people in the room stood up and shook her head in approval and said, this rabbi is a very wise man. I want to meet this wise man and learn from him. We have met this wise man and we have learned from him and none of us will ever be the same. My immortality, if there be such for me, is in your loyalty to God's special children, the widow, the orphan, the poor, the stranger in your gates, the weak, in this I take pride. It has been the greatest privilege to stand in the bright light of Rabbi Harold Schulweis and to be part of a team to help amplify that light for the good of the world. It has been the greatest privilege to learn from him, to partner in the repair of the world with him, and above all, to share a deep friendship with him. I will hold in the highest esteem his exceptional relationship with his perfect match, Malka, and with the grace with which Malka and her children shared their patriarch with me and with the world. How perfectly apt that he left us during Hanukkah, during the darkest time of the year, Hanukkah's flames create light. That is exactly what Rabbi Shulweis has done in so many profound ways for all of the years of his life. My immortality is bound up with God's eternity, with God's justice, truth, and righteousness, and that eternity is strengthened by your loyalty and your love. A friend wrote, it is said that in the end, people are judged not only by what they did, but, but for what they caused. Rabbi Shulweis caused so much peace, caused the lives of so many to be so much better, in some cases caused them to be at all. He caused the world to better understand the sacred power of conscience. Mourn me not with tears, ashes, or sackcloth, says Rabbi Shulweis. Honor me with laughter and with goodness, with these, the better part of me lives on beyond the grave. Sylvia Bernstein Tregub, president of the Shulweis Institute and very longtime friend of the rabbi. By the grace of Rabbi Schulweis, I am speaking today. Many months after he anticipated this moment and first spoke with me about delivering the eulogy. Some time ago, I asked him how hard it must be to write a eulogy for a dear friend. And he said, no, it wasn't really hard. At first, I didn't understand. But he explained that when the words were about a good, decent, and caring person, they were honest sentiments, they came from the heart. Nothing had to be manufactured. What was hard, he said, was to write a eulogy for someone of poor character. <laughs> he was right, to an extent. For these words come from my heart, and he is my dear friend, a good, and caring person and an extraordinary and brilliant human being. What we never discussed was how painful it would be to deliver these honest sentiments. As it will be for all of us, <clears throat> it'll take me a very long time to be accustomed to thinking and speaking about Rabbi Shulweis in the past tense. And I'm not speaking to him or with him. He was so significantly present in all our lives. From the very beginning of coming to Valley Beth Shalom, he created an environment where the synagogue served as the Beit HaMikdash, the Beit Tefillah, the Beit Knesset, a house of study, a house of prayer, and a house of assembly. It became our personal reality. 
Our lives were changed forever by this visionary in our midst. He set the bar so very high for creativity. He loved the excitement that came from ideas and passionately followed his conscience, taking action and turning visions into reality. He often spoke about a synagogue having windows, for its role is to open its eyes to the community and the world outside, to inspire us to act to meet the moral, spiritual, and intellectual needs of these communities in need of direction and repair and healing. He dearly loved this synagogue, and he felt strongly that Valley Beth Shalom had something to say and something important to give. It had a voice that must be heard. But a synagogue must have a courageous and a dynamic leader to stimulate that action. And that he was to his very core. For he explained that being a rabbi is not what he does, it's what he is. I never heard him complain about the hours of being too tired or the need to take a day off. Malka was the perfect partner, strong, wise, loving, caring, understanding, providing support and encouragement while forging her own model for the role of a wife or a rabbi in modernity. He often said that she was his rabbi. His encouragement was invaluable and so very convincing, reaching into the deepest recesses of our being. I think of the hundred of adults who became B'nai Mitzvah when responding to his, I know you can do this, as he walked around the congregation during the Shabbat of Passover. His feel for the pulse of the congregation and his sense of timing saw an end to genderism and the beginning of a new creative Judaism. He opened the door for me and for many more women to serve as the president of his congregation. Representing Valley Beth Shalom in the community was a very humbling experience, and one of which I, I remain very, very proud. The rabbi saw the end to homophobia as a synagogue reality he welcomed and celebrated and honored the strangers in our midst who chose Judaism. He initiated ecumenical dialogue, forging alliances with the Christian, Armenian, and Muslim communities, bringing them into this sanctuary and into our lives, steadfastly recognizing the goodness in people and believing in the important possibility of making friends friends with individuals, friends with movements, friends with countries, friends where there were thought to be none. And he called upon us to help him make the possible a reality. And we did. He often referred to Menachem Mendel of Kutsk and J.B. Soloveitchik and Mordecai Kaplan and Abraham Joshua Heschel among his many teachers just as Rabbis Feinstein, Hoffman, Farkas, and Taft refer to Rabbi Schulweis as their teacher. And as do we, for we were and we are all his students. To mentor future generations is to ensure immortality. In that, he has achieved immortality. The Rabbi Shabbat morning discussion with the congregation set a standard for a very unique opportunity to pray an ancient liturgy in a modern context with an existential interpretation. He was prepared each Shabbat to answer the questions he hoped we would ask. And when we didn't, he would ask them himself. <laughs> the synagogue was also a platform for his quick wit. Many of you will remember his convincing us he could play the violin holding us in great suspense, yet never playing a note. <laughs> and his auctioning of irrelevant items from his study on Simchat Torah, convincing us they were priceless, and we bought it, literally. His vision has shaped our thinking and shaped modern Judaism. For me personally, I never left a service, a program, a class without feeling elevated, having learned something new that would enrich my life and that of my families. 
for I took to heart his repeated instruction to teach these lessons to my children, to all our children. Many times I sought his wise counsel and relied on his wisdom to navigate an appropriate course of action, both in the synagogue and in my personal life. I was never disappointed. Though he didn't always have a solution, he offered sound judgment and encouragement. I vividly remember seeking his counsel in despair several years ago and several years after my late husband Maynard, Zichron Oliver Ha, passed away, questioning I would ever find someone and marry again. Here I was speaking with the rabbis whose writings are profound, whose sermons thought-provoking and oratory commanding, whose rich vocabulary required our use of the Oxford Unabridged Dictionary <laughs> to be fully comprehensible, and it wasn't always. So here we sat in his office, me and this world-renowned scholar, and in answer to my plea, he carefully looked at his bookshelves, at the many books he had authored, <clears throat> and the many other books and learned texts on philosophy and history and Jewish thought and practice that lined the shelves. And in doing what was most practical, he picked up the Valley Beth Shalom Directory of Membership. <laughs> And he said, let's start here. <laughs> and together, we scanned the membership list. <laughs> line by line, family by family, in order to help me find an eligible single man. <clears throat> he had the utmost regard for the individual, for the laity giving us the unique opportunity to partner with him in creating and participating in meaningful Jewish life-affirming programs, the Pararabbinic, the Havara, the VBS Counseling Center, and Sha'are Tikva for children and families with special needs in our community. His creating Jewish World Watch, the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, and launching Marsh Mazon became our call to conscience ennobling our efforts for the greater good. Somewhat in jest, he instructed all of the presidents who had the honor and good fortune to serve with him that it was our responsibility to protect him from the slings and arrows of unhappy congregants, <laughs> only sharing with him the good things that were said. Any other comments he assured us would be directly told to him. And we should have Rachmanus, we should have pity, for even rabbis have feelings and can be hurt. Through his leadership, an atmosphere of collegiality between the clergy, the staff, and the board of directors was established. And he taught us to think broadly in terms of both and, and not either or. Striving to improve on what is, to think in terms of what ought to be. He gave us many opportunities to take leadership positions and become very personally involved in tikkun olam and to make this world a better place and to make art a reality. Along with several other Chavarot, mine, Ache Nefesh, Soul Brothers, claims to be the first, well, certainly among the very first at Valley Beth Shalom. And in recognition of our good fortune, we presented a tribute book to the rabbi a few years ago on the occasion of marking 40 years of sharing our Jewish life experiences and making very important friendships, as well on the occasion of the rabbi's birthday. The book contained very personal messages of tribute and gratitude from each member. And it was especially meaningful for each of us to very personally express our gratitude to the man who forever opened our eyes and our hearts and gave us permission to challenge and to grow, meaningfully changing our lives and that of our families. In addition to his remarkable sermons, his insightful poetry and meditations help us navigate as well as celebrate many of the rites of passage. There are lessons about birth and death and all the passages in between. Powerful and tender words, words of celebration and comfort, 
words of joy and sorrow, words to be read, words to be sung. And far too often I sat with the rabbi and Malka at his hospital bedside and prayed for his recovery, for the skill of the doctors. And many times upon his recoveries with profound gratitude, he turned to poetry and in the form of meditations, he expressed his innermost thoughts about life and healing and death and appreciation. All of his meditations will be published by the Schulweis Institute in a new book containing over 150 poems that will help guide us through our personal life's journeys. And it is to the dignity, elegance, and wisdom of the rabbi's poetry that we will continue to turn for these life-affirming lessons. The Harold M. Schulweis Institute, the Center for Jewish Learning, was created through the generosity of temple members in celebration of the rabbi's 80th birthday to share with generations to come the rabbi's vision of life and learning as developed at Valley Beth Shalom. The Schulweis Library, just one aspect of the institute, collects and preserves the rabbi's vast repository of writings and oratory. And as is our intent, this body of work will remain a living legacy for the generations to come. My husband, Bert, has assumed the responsibility of editing and posting all this material on the Institute website. And it continues to be taking a very long time because of its sheer volume and his enjoyment as a labor of love. For many years, coming home from work each day, as well as in recent days, I would be greeted by the rabbi's recorded voice delivering a sermon preached decades ago. His voice was strong, and the relevancy of the message had not waned with the years. Available online is the Institute recently published book of a previously undiscovered, unpublished, and undated manuscript. When you're older, you'll understand kindling the religious questions of our youth. And it was the rabbi's intent that the lessons of this book be transmitted to our children and our grandchildren. In our last conversation just this past week, he spoke of the many world issues troubling him and of his great concern for our youth, for their attachment to their Jewish roots, for their important potential as activists, and for the role of the synagogue in igniting their passion for the good of humankind. For those of us serving on the Institute Board, nothing gives us more pleasure than to endorse a program near and dear to the rabbi, many of which continue to support programs and projects advanced by our BBS rabbis and BBS schools, thereby enriching all of our lives every day. A recent project was the creation of the Jewish Community Children's Choir, as it was so important to him that Jewish children across the denominations, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, get to know each other and create important memories, and through what better medium than learning and singing Jewish music together. And that they do. The choir, 40 or so strong in its third year, continues to thrive and perform. And his joy was obvious when attending the choir's very first performance. His pleasure affirmed, this is what we ought to do. And we did. With the establishment of the awarding of the Schulweis Humanitarian Award of May of 2012, Valley Beth Shalom set the foundation for the ongoing recognition and honoring in the rabbi's name those outstanding individuals and organizations that transcend the ordinary and exemplify the highest level of social conscience. It speaks to who we are and what we believe as a community and as Jews. It speaks to the influence of Rabbi Shulweis's teachings. And in his name, Valley Beth Shalom and the Shulweis Institute will continue the practice of awarding this prestigious Shulweis Humanitarian Award. The rabbi loved the VBS Congregational Choir and enthusiastically supported the artistry of composer Amina Davaloni, Zichron Olavracha, whose beautiful compositions we will continue to sing 
and some of his works very appropriately today. He loved Tommy, Ami's Torah service and Hallel and jazz service, and his composition for the covenantal Friday night Shabbat prayer of the Shamru, which we chanted a cappella without accompaniment, was among the rabbis and our favorite. You will remember the Shamru B'nai Yisrael, the Shamru et Shabbat, the people of Israel shall observe the Sabbath. His vision was steadfast in his, and as he voiced when speaking with us at our institute governor's meeting during this past Sukkot. He said he wished he were younger, that he loved the synagogue and he loved us, and he hoped we would all meet again in good health and good voice with hope and a sense that with our conviction, our loyalty, our idealism, our vision, and our action, tomorrow would be better for us, for our people, and for humankind. May his hope become our reality, and his memory bless us all. To Malka, my dear friend, Ethan and Cindy, Seth, Elisa, and Peter, and grandchildren, Yonatan, Avital, Ben, Corinne, Miranda, Aaron, Sarah, Eli, and Gabriel, and the entire Shulweis family. We profoundly share your sorrow, and as your loving friends and community, we grieve with you and offer you our support and comfort. Dr. Uri Hersher, president of the Skirball Cultural Center and dear friend of the rabbi. While listening to all the beloved voices in tribute, I've also been staring at the casket. I don't want to avoid it. I am having a hard time with the past tense. supposed to continue to talk with us. To teach us. I'm not yet accepting of this. When the rabbinic sage Resh Lakish died, the Talmud teaches that his mentee, Rav Yochanan, was plunged into grief. The sages sought to comfort him, but he would not be comforted. All he could ask was, where are you? Where are you, a son of Lakasha? Where are you? So we too are plunged in grief today, we too are inconsolable. 
we too mourn a mighty sage. Across the impassable border of speech and sight and touch and hand, we too ask, how can we call you back? Where are you? Where are you? Our precious teacher and friend. And how can we go on? How can we go on without you? The story is told that when God created the first human beings, the angels were jealous, having heard that new creatures were made in God's image, the angels conspired to hide the image where human beings would never find it. One of the angels wanted to hide it in the depth of the ocean. Another proposed to bury it on the highest mountain. But the shrewdest of the angels had a better idea. Let us hide God's image in their own hearts. That is the last place they would look for it. You have guessed who told this story. You have guessed from its poetry, its depth, its compassion, and its truth. You have guessed from its grounding in Torah, its deeply rabbinic essence and nuance, its bold and brave assertion that human beings are, in their capacity for goodness, even higher than the angels. All of these are attributes of both the story and the storyteller. All of these describe his life, the learning, and the legacy of the mightiest of sages, Rabbi Harold Schulweis. About a year ago, the Skirball Cultural Center celebrated its 18th year of life with a gala celebration of its founding. Harold Schulweis, I asked Harold, to give the invocation, which gave me the honor of introducing him. I struggled for words that would do him justice. If the words were fitting then, they seem to me even more fitting now. And here is what I said. And thank goodness I can say it in the present tense rather than in the past. Rabbi Harold Schulweis is a rabbi. And this is like saying that Rembrandt is a painting or Stradivarius is a violin. Rabbi Harold Schulweis is more than a rabbi. As I'm told by my son in Israel, every Facebook, thousands of Facebooks are talking with one another as they are in North America, all addressing him as the rabbi of rabbis. He's a teacher, a writer, a poet of the pulpit, a prophet of justice, a thinker of astounding power and insight. Remember, this is in the present. He was there. Truly to read Rabbi Shoais, to hear Rabbi Shoais, is a transformative experience. He has, as much as any rabbi of our time, given Judaism meaning, relevance, and renewed purpose. 
yet learning from Harold, as meaningful as it may be, pales besides the privilege of knowing him. And both the learning and the knowing have been my privilege for 55 years. He's both mentor and beloved friend to me, to my wife, Mina, and to our sons. He is, for us all, a constant and irreplaceable source of wisdom and inspiration. How grateful we are for his presence in our lives. <laughs> the first time I saw and heard Rabbi Showais was over a century ago. I was a very rebellious freshman at UC Berkeley, accompanying a friend to high holiday service in Oakland. I went along very reluctantly. It was not my plan to be in shul on Rosh Hashanah. I was expecting to be unmoved until I heard Rabbi Showais. I can't say that I saw him because what the shul provided us at UC Berkeley was the rafters. So I saw this man. I couldn't quite tell of his features until he spoke. I heard his voice. The subject was the binding of Isaac. After all these years, I still remember his interpretation. I wasn't even planning to be attentive. Said Rabbi Showais, the angel who stayed Abraham's hand was not a supernatural being, but Abraham's own conscience. To me, this was a stunning insight. Lifting the text at one stroke from the literal to the from the literal realm to the ethical. Harold had a rare gift for that, didn't he? In his hands, the Torah became not only relevant, but real and urgent. He opened up the ancient words to modern eyes. He certainly opened mine. When I left the synagogue that day, I had found a rabbi. I wasn't very fond of rabbis. I had found a rabbi, not just for a day, but for a lifetime. Over 50 years of friendship, Harold and I shared countless conversations, and none are forgettable. I particularly think of the, thir the Thursday evening dinners in recent years, Malka, which mine and I shared with you and Harold. We couldn't wait. We were so happy Thursday evening had come. And we did so up to the very end. Harold's voice was no longer as strong, but to cite the Torah he loved so much, his eye was undimmed. The Torah, said Harold, is all about character. And Harold, like the Torah, was character itself. A week prior to his death, Harold mentioned a liturgical passage to me, and when I didn't recognize it, 
he took me upstairs with Mina and Malka, and he took me to his study, which was beside his bed. He pulled out an old prayer book. Now remember, he was not well, and yet he, he found his hand and he touched a prayer book, and he took out the prayer book, unerringly locating it immediately. It's not a famous liturgical passage. Not at all. But he noted, he noted it, and he remembered it because it was about character. I share it with you now. Oh, incidentally, he not only found it immediately, but he said, you know, Uri, I think it's on page 44. <laughs> and there it was on page 44, and it read, May it be thy will, O Lord, my God and God of my fathers, to deliver me this day and every day from arrogance and from arrogant men, from every corrupt person, from every evil companion, from the dangers that lurk about me, from a harsh judgment and an implacable opponent, whether or not he be an adherent of our faith. What moves me so, dip, so deeply about these words is not what they say, but how Harold, to the end of his life, and this is not the end of your life, took me so to heart, remembered them, spoke of them, lived them the full length of his day. In the end, character is what we have, Uri. That's all we have. And there is nothing more precious we can bequeath. Harold taught me this, but even more, he showed me. He showed me. When I was first exploring the feasibility of building what became the Skirball Cultural Center, Harold was my companion and champion. Some, believe it or not, in our own community were rather skeptical. But skepticism was not his way. Others were concerned about their turf. But Harold didn't, didn't believe in turf. He loved the Jewish people. He loved you. And he loved Jewish learning and he loved Jewish values, and he lived them. That was his character. He believed that whatever enhanced Jewish life enhanced humanity itself. Those most beloved of all to Harold Schulweis, those who were the life of his life, of course, you, Malka, your children, and your, your grandchildren. Some years ago, Harold dedicated a poem to you, Malcolm. In his poem, for all its beauty, is nearly but could never be as beautiful as you are. It's entitled, Yet, Yet for Malka. You are not me, and I am not you. Yet, you know me better than I know myself. You complete my sentences, fill the pauses, read between my lines, and how we witness that every Thursday evening you are not me, and I am not you. Yet, when we are not together, my sight, my hearing, my touch are different. We are separate, 
Yet, you know me so well, Malka. In Hebrew, love and knowledge are the same. To know is to love, to love is to know. You know me with the mind of the heart, my strengths and my weaknesses, my dreams and my angers. You know me in the marrow of your being. They say that six decades is a long time in marriage, and yet, how brief it is. We have, rich, we have reached the harvest of many years. Here you are, children and children's children. They dance and play before us. And in their eyes, we see yet another pair of ourselves. The best is yet to be. Dearest Malka, children and grandchildren, all of us who love this remarkable poet, this remarkable man, can only know a fraction, only a fraction of your love for him. We can only feel a fraction of your loss. But we take comfort, as we hope you can, from the knowledge that a love as deep and as lasting as his can never, ever, ever leave you. Nor can it leave any of us here whose lives Harold touched, enriched, inspired and blessed. How can we repay his countless gifts to us, his kindness, his compassion, his wisdom and his warmth? All we can do is cherish them, draw strength from them, and strive in our own lives to emulate we may never reach Harold Schoeweiss's noble height, but we will all stand taller. The angels, so Rabbi Schoeweiss taught, chose to hide the divine image in our hearts because that is the last place we will look for it but it is the first place I will look for you, Harold. The first place I will look for you. And I will always find you there. Where are you? I know where you are. You dwell in my heart and you shine in my soul. Now and always, with a light that can and will never, ever go out. We offer a prayer together, Ahavat Olam, a prayer of love, eternal love unending. I ask you please to rise for this prayer.
for show wise it would go a little long, right? <laughs> Dr. Seth Showweiss will be speaking on behalf of the family. Please. Our family is used to sharing my dad, and we are so grateful to have you who he considered his extended family to remember and celebrate his life. Alongside my dad's seriousness and intensity, he was known best by us as a great kidder. In quiet moments every once in a while, he joke about this day, saying he wanted to tape his own eulogy. <laughs> I I'm glad he didn't. First of all, he'd have showed us all up. But truly, his modesty would have distracted us from celebrating his life and hearing the deep thoughts and emotions we're all sharing. It's not just that my dad was a great kidder. He loved to tell stories. When thinking about what to share about my dad, these three stories came to mind because they exemplify how he interacted with me, and my family, and the world. First story. I get a call, he's in the ER, I rush over. Uh, before I can say anything, he says to me, can you believe Senator McCain? Now my dad was a big boxing fan, and McCain was the head of the Arizona Boxing Commission. And he was very, very upset with something that McCain had decided to do with this boxing commission. And after three minutes, I said, Dad, how are you feeling? He goes, oh, oh terrible. If you know my dad at all, that really does fit. This was my dad, even when he was struggling and in pain in the hospital, he relished the opportunity 
to talk to one of his kids about a topic we both loved. And he sees moments, and we had a moment together. Another story. Uh, when I was a kid, probably between 8 and 12, we went every summer to Yosemite. And uh, my dad, not actually being a big camping person, this was perfect. <laughs> he got to be the, uh, the uh, rabbi of the valley. And uh, we would, uh, he would give a sermon and lead services on Saturday morning. But the story that I'm going to tell you is that we would go to the ecumenical chapel, and our first task was to flip over the, uh, all the ornaments from the prior service, which was last Sunday, um, and to make it into a Jewish service. So we would take the cross and put it away. We would take all of the, you know, the... Um, vestments that were all over the place. And the thing that I got from my father was how much reverence and respect he had. And I know that he taught it, but to see it in action was, that's, I guess, the point of that story. Um, so through Summers in Yosemite taught us to respect, to have respect for others, their beliefs, and their symbols. And I'm going to close with a, a third story. Uh, I was 16, I'd just gotten my license. My brother was uh, 14, I get a call from my dad. Um, are you home? Now, that was kind of a funny question, being that this is way before cell phones. <laughs> and um, he said, grab your brother and uh, come as you are. So we drove over to Shoal uh, at Temple Beth Abraham in Oakland in our shorts and sandals or whatever we were doing during the summer. And what we encountered there was a young couple that my father had just met who had uh, come into Oakland and they wanted to get married. And of course they needed a deem to sign the ketubah. The ketuba. So my brother and I were able to do that. We signed the ketubah and we were about ready to go home and my dad motioned us into the sanctuary, this couple, one of their friends, my brother and myself. That was it. Um, and he proceeded to perform the wedding ceremony. And then he proceeded to talk full, full voice um, as if it was an entirely full congregation. <laughs> <laughs> For 25 minutes. Uh, he spoke to them, guiding them into their union because it was the most important day of, of their lives, privately, publicly, small stage, or global stage. My dad showed up as the man that he was. He recognized the significance and holiness of that moment for this couple. One story is about how to handle difficulty and challenge. One's about how to respect other, and one's about how to see the big picture and elevate the sacred in all situations. My father's lessons, those are the, some of the lessons that raised me and I think raised all of us. Thank you again for being here. My mother, brother, sister, our partners, and all his grandchildren are, are only the start of his family that he kept close to him. I know that each of you were impacted and I know that he considered you his family, from Valley Beth Shalom to the Los Angeles community, to the people of Israel, and all of humanity. For me as his son, I know that all of us as a family are grieving together. Dad, I'm, I'm going to miss you. My family is already missing you, just as we did Friday night last when we had our Shabbat dinner. I know that we are all going to miss him. I'd like to read something that Ben, one of my dad's four grandchildren in Israel, wrote. Suddenly you're alone, tells me the telephone. 
my ears aren't used to hearing heavy words. Another soul has left the building and I am alone. I am here, thinking about the deep blue ocean that separates us. Why didn't I have the courage to cross it? Why I didn't have the words to say it? Hearing about him all my life and I just can't see him. I remember one time I sat with him. I was on the gray soft rug and he was on his leather sofa with his regular black suit and eyes that were full of wisdom. His tie was a little loose and, and I can't explain the magic I felt inside the warm living room. I listened very closely. I was magnified and couldn't believe how many ideas and deep thoughts one person can contain. But in his blood flows my blood. In his brain flows my thoughts. If I had had just one last moment in front of him to say, only one word, I would say the same thing I told him on the gray and soft rug, Saba, man, life, legacy. Thank you. You always let me speak last and you always told me to make it brief. <laughs> and I will do both. You knew that I loved stories. And so you taught me a story, same beautiful story Uri just told. When the angels of heaven learned that God was going to make the human being in the divine image, the angels conspired. How can you create a creature so corrupt and debased and plant there something as fine and pure as divinity? So the angels conspired to steal it and hide it where man would never find it. They met in urgent council and discussed this plan. And one said, put it at the top of the highest mountain. And the other said, no, someday he will climb that mountain and find it. And one said, put it at the bottom of the lowest sea. And the other said, no, someday he will plumb those depths and find it. And some said, put it at the end of the most forbidding wilderness. And the other said, no, someday he will traverse that wilderness, he will find it. And then up stepped the most shrewd of the angels and said, my brothers, the solution is clear. Plant it in his heart, he will never Look for it there. Harold, that was your truth. That's the essence of all you taught us. Divinity is not far away. Divinity is proximate. It is hidden in us. But we don't know it. So you set yourself the task of holding up a mirror so that we would see who and what we really are. Hold up a mirror so that we would understand how important we are, how significant, how powerful we are. That was your prophecy. And so I added a postscript to the story. God always follows the advice of God's angels, so he created the human being and he planted the image deep, deep, deep in the human heart, so deep that no one can find it alone, but not so deep that the one who loves you the most can help you find it for you. The 30th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, at the very end of the Torah, Moses speaks to his people his last word, his last truth. He says to the people, Israel, this truth is not too difficult for you. It is not beyond you. Lo bashamayim he. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up and get it for us? It is not beyond the sea that you would say, who can cross the sea and get it for us? No, ki karov, it is close to you. 
It is in your mouth and in your heart to do it. This is what you meant by predicate theology. Divinity is not far away. God is not up there. God is not out there. God is in here, in us, in our acts, and in our words, and in our dreams, and in our ideals. God is known in moments of self-transcendence, loving and caring and healing and giving. God speaks the voice of conscience. It lifts us up and draws us upward to be better. It draws us outward to be loving. It draws us forward to be giving. It protects us from hopelessness and helplessness and despair. You were a prophet who taught that Torah. And you demanded that we acknowledge and recognize that our lives matter, that our actions matter, that our voices are heard you would not allow us to sink into small thinking or triviality or self-absorption or helplessness. It held up a mirror, and that mirror was Torah. Torah as a mirror to see the divinity within. In Judaism, you found the exquisite language for self-transcendence. And so you were embarrassed by the smallness of spirit and the hollow superficiality of so much of Jewish life. You were enraged by a Judaism self-absorbed and morally oblivious. You were offended by a Judaism resentful and afraid of the world. Offended by rabbis who had nothing to say. Offended by prayer that was superficial and learning that was trivialized. The Hasidic master once asked his students, what's the most important moment in all of Jewish history? The student said, Rebbe, the most important moment must be the giving of Torah and Sinai. Another student said, Rebbe, the most important moment must be the erection of the Beit HaMikdash, the holy temple in Jerusalem. Rebbe, the most important moment must be when Maimonides sat to write the code of Jewish law. And the Rebbe said, no, those are great moments. But the most important moment in all of Jewish history is now, this moment. Because all of those moments mean nothing if they don't find a place in this moment. This moment is the most important moment, and you, Harold, you insisted in this moment. You insisted that Torah be read in the present tense. Not about yesterday, but about today and tomorrow. You insisted that the question we asked is not what is, but what ought to be. Not what is the state of the world, but how would we have it. Not what is the synagogue, but what ought it be. Not who we are, but who we aspire to become. And you worshipped a god you called Adonai. You notice that Adonai, the name of God, is only first pronounced in the Bible once human beings enter the world. Adonai is the name of the human capacity for self-transcendence, for the human capacity to transform and reshape and heal a world. Adonai, the power of human beings to create the world of God's dreams. And you worshiped Adonai, that power of transcendence. You taught us to reach across the loneliness and alienation of suburban life to build Chavarot. You, told us, you taught us to reach across the loneliness and alienation beyond the isolation and privatism, beyond the individualism, to share the moments of life that matter, to become para-rabbinics and counselors to one another. You taught us to find Adonai by opening the synagogue to those once excluded, to children and adults with special needs, to gays and lesbians and their families, 
to those who are hungry and indigent and homeless, to people of all faith seeking truth. The synagogue you taught was the center of self-transcendence. Its doors must never be closed. Its windows must never be opaque. God lives here. Shechina lives here. This must be the place of self-transcendence. And you taught us that in self-transcendence, in loving and healing and caring, lies a life that is purposeful, significant, important. You taught us that we matter. Every place you went mattered. Every meeting, every committee, every class you taught, every lecture, you taught us that this moment is historic and significant and it matters. Made it impossible to make small talk with you. <laughs> I remember sitting at lunch once trying to talk small talk with you. Talk about sports, talk about the weather, talk about politics, talk about, talk about computers, which you really didn't understand. <laughs> you looked at me and you said, have you read Boober? <laughs> Check, please. <laughs> and Midrash taught that the burning bush that Moses saw, the burning bush didn't just arrive. The burning bush was there since the day of creation. Thousands and thousands of people walked by. Nobody ever stopped to look. What made Moses extraordinary is he saw, and he saw within. You insisted that every moment was laden with responsibility and significance, that every moment had the potential to become revelatory, to be historic, that moments mattered, that there was nothing trivial in the world. You took on the greatest challenge in all of Jewish history, how to believe, how to stand up after the Holocaust, if God is known in self-transcendence, where is God in the silent, cold darkness, in the immeasurable evil of the Shoah? And then you found a man, Hermann Graber, who worked as a janitor in a hotel in San Francisco. And you discovered that when he was living in Germany, he saved hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jews. You met a young man named Jacob Roslin teaching mathematics at the university who was saved by the Polish Christians next door. You discovered Sempo Sugihara and the village of Ashambon, and you brought them here. You brought them here so we could meet them. You remember the Danish policeman, tall, blonde man now living in Orange County? who spent all day working as a policeman in Copenhagen and at night smuggling Jews down to the port, bribing fishermen to take them to Sweden. And we asked him, why? Why did you do this? And he shook his head like it was a silly question. It was right. It was good. And we cried because God Donai did not die in Auschwitz, because goodness did not die in the darkness, in these extraordinary men and women, ready to risk everything for people they didn't know, you found a rebirth of Adonai, a rebirth of God. You resurrected God. You revived God. You rescued God from the clutches of the darkness of that evil. A God of self-transcendence, a God of conscience, a God of life. But still you were not satisfied. You were never satisfied. <laughs> you told me when I first took the job, you looked me in the eye and said, I'm never going to retire. <laughs> I said, go for it. <laughs> you said, I'm never going to retire. I'm going to drop dead on the pulpit. I said, can I choose the bar mitzvah? <laughs> You didn't like that joke. <laughs> you taught us never again, never again, can't just mean never again for us. 
We are a global people living in a global era. Ours is a God who is Melech Ha'olam, not Melech Yisrael. Our genocide, as dark and horrid, has been duplicated. Duplicated in Cambodia and Bosnia and Rwanda, and where were we? Where was our protest? Where was the voice of our conscience? And now that it is duplicated in Darfur and the Congo, where are we? So in your last decade, you created Jewish World Watch so that you would be able to face your grandchildren when they ask you, where were you, Zayda? You taught us. Ours are the hands of God. And ours are the eyes of God. And ours is the voice of God. And God lives only so long as conscience lives in us. I heard you for the first time. Gesundheit. I heard you for the first time <laughs> in 1970, your very first sermon in this synagogue, on this pulpit, at Slichus. It was my first date with Nina. We went to a beautiful dinner, a concert at the Hollywood Bowl, I put my arm around the girl and said, where would you like to go now? And she said, let's go to shul. <laughs> I said, that wasn't exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> but OK, where should we go? And she said, there's a new rabbi in the valley. Let's go hear him. So we drove over here. And we sat in that corner, all the way back there, two kids in corduroy jeans and work shirts and desert boots, along with hundreds of other kids in corduroy jeans and work shirts and desert boots. And I fell in love twice that night. I had never heard a Torah like yours. I'd never heard a Torah expounded with such passion and such urgency, a Torah spoken in the present tense. I'd never heard a rabbi who told me that God lives as long as I live godly. I'd never heard a Torah that demanded so much of me as an answer, a response, a responsibility, a real life. And I wanted to teach that Torah. I wanted to hold it and share it and teach it. But I had too many questions. Too many questions. Too many questions. You said to me, your questions are sacred. Your questions, you only question that which you love. And so your questions are sacred. Questions are the seeds of transcendence. Questions are the tools for rebuilding and reinterpreting a tradition. Your questions keep God alive in the world. God loves your questions. So I came to work for you. And every morning, you stepped into my office with your coffee your mail, and a question. And I got no work done. Because <laughs> we spent hours arguing over those questions. I am not done yet. I am not finished yet. I will continue to ask your questions. And I will come in Monday morning, tomorrow morning, and I will wait for your question. Because that question brings God back into the world. I once asked you in a little interview, what does the name Shulweis mean? And you taught me it's an acronym for a Hebrew phrase. Shechieh v'yizkeh lirot v'nechamat tzion. May we have life and merit to see the restoration of Zion. Shulweis, your name is a prayer. Your Torah rescued God, rescued a whole generation of Jews, raised up thousands of teachers and rabbis and students, raised up the hearts of the Jewish people, until such time as we merit to see the restoration of Zion, we will ask your questions. 
Thank you, Harold. Please rise. Moreno, Harav, Svi, Ben Moshe, Vishene Hene, Shelamad, will he made at Masore Taminu, Vishamar, Bikedusha, Kevod, Am Israel, Vyaret Israel. בכל לבבו, ובכל נפשו, ובכל מיודו.
God, source of life and author of death, grant perfect peace in your sheltering presence, in the presence of all whose lives are whole and full and pure, to the soul of our beloved teacher, Rabbi Harold Schulweis, who spent his life devoted to teaching Torah, defending the spirit, the truth, and the honor of the people Israel, and who has come to his eternal home with you, God. Source of life, bind this life into the bonds of eternal life, and let him rest now in peace. Amen. Please be seated. In just a moment, we will conclude the service. The casket will be carried through the congregation and out of the synagogue. Casket bearers will include all of the Shulweis grandchildren, Shulweis sons-in-law and daughters-in-law, and Mr. Bert Tragov will lead the casket bearers. Following this service, once again, the burial service will be private for the family and their invited guests. Please help us to protect the family in these very trying moments and respect that request. We will gather once again this evening at 6 p.m. here in the synagogue. The family will come and join us for some time to be together. At 7 p.m., we will pray the Mariv, the Arvit prayers, and recite the Kaddish together. This evening, we will ask our dear friends, the teacher's father, Alexei Smith, of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and Rabbi David Wolpe, of Sinai Temple to share their reflections of the rabbi's life and his legacy. Each evening this week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 6 p.m. here in the synagogue, we gather at 7 p.m. we pray. On Monday night, Rabbi Mark Borowitz and Dr. Ron Wolfson. On Tuesday night, Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson. On Wednesday night, Rabbi Ronit Sadok. And on Thursday night, all of us who share the rabbi here in the Valley Beth Shalom community will share our reflections. Each morning, a Shiva minion will be held here in the synagogue together with the daily minion of the congregation in the Weiner Chapel, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7.30 in the morning. Thursday, because it is a national holiday, at 8.30 in the morning, and then Friday again at 7.30 in the morning. Family and guests and friends of the Shulweis family are invited to the Shulweis Children's Home Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at Seth and Esther's home, Thursday at 7.30. 7? 8.30. 8.30, sorry. Your house, I got that. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at Seth's house at 7.30. Bring bagels. <laughs> Thursday, Friday at Elisa and Peter's house at 8.30. Bring more bagels. <laughs> Either here or in the city, there's a minion for everyone. And of course, we will be together, God willing, on Shabbat. The family would appreciate your gestures of love and support with a contribution to a charity that meant something to the rabbi, to the synagogue, Valley Beth Shalom, to the Jewish World Watch, to the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, 
or to the Harold M. Schulweis Institute or the Harold M. Schulweis Day School. All of those would be most welcome or any charity that you deem fit. Once again, your presence means so much to us all. We share the grief of our loss. We share our love with Malka, the children, and this wonderful family. We share the rabbi's Torah, his teaching, and his truth. Would you please rise now as the casket is escorted from the sanctuary. As the casket is escorted from the sanctuary by the rabbi's family, the, rabbi respectful, the rabbi's family respectfully requests that the past presidents of Valley Beth Shalom escort the casket as well in the role of honorary casket bearers. Once again, thank you all very much for your presence and your kindness. <laughs> 